Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. Space, the final frontier. Now that we've figured out where Wonder Woman and all those super hot Amazonian girls are from. Israel. I mean, it was so obvious. It was standing right there in front of us the entire time. Have you guys ever met an Israeli girl? Look, here's 2018's Miss Israel. I know, it's not Wonder Woman. They just all kind of look like that. Anyway, back to space. Every time I see a Star Wars movie, I always think to myself, will we one day be able to build a Star Destroyer here on Earth so that we can travel through the stars safely and in comfort? I mean, what's the point of discovering other sentient beings if you can't use brute force to save them from their own primitive ways? Now, currently, space exploration is pretty low on the to-do list for Earth's governments. As a matter of fact, in the U.S., private firms have taken over missions previously carried out by NASA. Our current administration's budget for NASA is only $20 billion, or 0.5% of the entire budget. That's only a few billion dollars more than we spend on the Department of Agriculture, which is important, but you really can't grow anything if the alien scum come invade Earth and steal all of our water, right? In contrast, our Department of Defense has a budget of $574 billion, which is 14% of our budget. At the height of America's space program in 1966, NASA spent 4.4% of the budget, and we did amazing things during that period of time. We landed a man on the moon, sent probes across the galaxy, and found hidden lunar Nazi bases on the dark side of the moon. Now, I'm not saying we need to increase NASA's budget to 4% in order to build an Imperial Star Destroyer. What we need to do is change the mindset of how important space exploration and technology is. We need to make it a priority, not just here in the United States, but all over the world. To put something that large in space, it would most likely have to be a global effort. And realistically speaking, that's unlikely to happen unless we get invaded by aliens or we encounter an Armageddon deep impact scenario. The largest man-made structure we've ever placed in space is the International Space Station. It's about 100 meters wide, 70 meters long, and weighs around 462 tons and costs around $150 billion to build. That's nowhere near the size of an Imperial class Star Destroyer, which is 1,600 meters long and much bulkier. It also took over 40 separate launches to get all the International Space Station's parts into low Earth orbit at 255 miles above the planet's surface. That's just a bit further than New York City is to Washington, D.C. So what kind of capability do we have when it comes to launching things into space? Well, the most powerful rocket in Earth's spacefaring history was the Saturn V rocket. It had a payload of 140 tons and was extremely expensive to launch. We're not really sure how much an Imperial class Star Destroyer weighs, but I expect it would be in the range of several millions of tons of material. And unlike the ISS, the Imperial class Star Destroyer does much more than just orbit the Earth. It's supposed to travel through space. So it couldn't be built with just a bunch of interconnecting modules like the ISS. It would need a solid superstructure so that the ship could withstand the tremendous amounts of G-force the ship would be exposed to. Some Imperial class Star Destroyers were even used to enter atmosphere. So the most realistic way for us to build a ship of that size is to build it in space and harvest the majority of the raw materials from space. Obviously, there will be some components that need to be sent up from Earth, but the majority of the raw materials need to be mined from our own solar system. I mean, technically, we do have the technology for space mining at a theoretical level. But the main hurdle right now is the economic feasibility of such a mission. We know that many asteroids are full of rich minerals, but like any mining venture, companies need to survey a specific asteroid and then develop a plan to mine there and make sure the cost for such a venture won't outweigh the revenue. Several companies are already in the process of developing prototype mining drones. It seems inevitable that companies will eventually figure out how to do it in a cost-proficient way. If we can land on the moon in the 60s in a tin bucket, we can surely bring an asteroid back to Earth's orbit in the 21st century and mine the crap out of it. But again, there needs to be a financial incentive to create the industry in the first place. But imagine this, some private company manages to bring back a haul of gold from an asteroid it captured, introducing thousands of tons of gold into the Earth's economy. A new gold rush would start and gold prices would dip rapidly. Before you know it, you would have mining companies that have power and wealth that can rival any nation on Earth. Well, at first, the majority of raw materials harvested in space will be shot back to Earth for consumption. The creation of space boundaries and processing plants can quickly turn these new raw materials into fuel and building materials for starships. Then factories and engineering buildings would need to be built to turn the building materials into parts for our massive ship. We would need to build an orbital shipyard similar to the ones we see in Kuat and Star Wars. It's also possible that we could create a large base on the moon for similar purposes. But we would have to wipe out the Nazis on the other side first. Being able to construct things in orbit eliminates one of the biggest problems that starship designers face, and that's weight. 
If we're able to start in space, that means we don't need to rely on weaker and lighter alloys. For instance, the space shuttle's thermal protection system was made of extremely fragile silica-based materials that were excellent at not absorbing heat but easily damaged, which is exactly what happened during the Columbia shuttle disaster. A piece of foam penetrated the TPS, which allowed extreme temperatures to enter the airframe of the shuttle and destroy it. The space shuttle's airframe was also made of aluminum instead of titanium because of weight issues. Another problem with space travel is the danger of cosmic radiation. The best shield against such radiation would be a heavy metal like lead. But again, because of weight restrictions, here on Earth, scientists are developing other methods to shield our astronauts like using food, water, and even fecal matter. Poop. With less weight issues and stronger materials, there will be more flexibility when it comes to ship designs. Spacecraft can be made larger and more elaborate. Up until now, all spacecraft have been designed in a cylindrical shape because it's one of the strongest geometric shapes. So as far as building a ship as large in tonnage as an Imperial class Star Destroyer, there's no reason why we wouldn't be able to do so, as long as we have developed an infrastructure in space to handle it. The real limitation is why would we need to build something as large as a Star Destroyer besides the fact that it's really awesome to have one. On top of that, our species doesn't possess the knowledge of how to create a hyperdrive or reflector shield. We also don't have artificial gravity, so while it might look like a Star Destroyer on the outside, people will just be floating around in the hallways on the inside. Most likely, some centrifuges would need to be built in the ship somewhere to simulate gravity. We also don't really have turbolaser technology, although I'm sure we'll arm our ships with missiles, railguns, and even lasers to take out satellites. So yeah, I think Earth has the capability to build a Star Destroyer. I'm an optimist after all. But what we lack is the need to make one. We also definitely have the resources to do it. Our planet spends around $1.7 trillion a year on the combined militaries of Earth. What if we could put all that killing power into a giant fleet of ships? And finally take it to those blue monkeys over on Pandora hashtag humanity first. Well guys, that's our video today. I hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to subscribe, uh, hit that notification button so you don't miss out on the rest of our content and like us on Facebook. Well, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.